I'm just uh, trying to learn the technology quickly. Well, I take my watch off. Um, thought I'd <coughs> give a, a title to it. Um, that didn't mean I necessarily had to fully understand the title, but presumably some part of me did. Uh, but I, I, I felt that whatever I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, probably it wasn't exactly what the, uh, the, what the title of the session suggested. So I uh, really congratulate the organizers, and, uh, of whom I'm not actually one, on this conference. They're very interesting. Thank them for that. But I'm not sure I want to thank them for being asked to talk about it. Uh, a topic that I, I thought I found rather uncomfortable. So what I've done is I, I start from the, the obvious things. One would say, hope that's better. Start from the, the obvious things that one would say about mathematics and economics and uh, try to get uh, more and more into the examples of uh, what mathematics is in, in economics. Uh, trying to be as relevant to the, the things that we are thinking about today as possible. I'm afraid it's therefore perhaps a little bit backward looking, which is partly because I think that uh, economics had uh, done a lot long ago, which uh, was really very relevant to understanding our current troubles which uh, somehow not got neglected. So I tend to be more backward looking in these things than, than most people. So I want to start. Uh, I've got to find a, a way of uh, moving this on. I, I think mathematics is a part of language. Um, I, I'm not going to commit the full power of saying it's, uh, it's part of logic because we know there are some difficulties about that. Uh, I, it's an advanced part of language and logic, and uh, we need it, whether in numbers or in symbols or in pictures, when the going gets tough. And uh, in economics, it doesn't always get particularly tough, and uh, I have no difficulty in uh, agreeing that an awful lot of economics is going to be done without mathematics. Uh, of course, I'd love to have some equations and graphs in this talk, but I'm not going to. But I think I am going to be doing some mathematics. It's just that I'll express it verbally uh, and see whether you think that's a, a reasonable account once I get to the end. Well, uh, inevitably, much of economic analysis is going to be couched in mathematics, probably not very difficult mathematics because economics deals with things numerical, prices and quantities, as Duncan pointed out. And that's not the only reason for the increasingly, increasingly prominent role of mathematics. Among the subjects that economists take to be within their compass, their choice, particularly optimal decisions, and that seems clearly something worth thinking about, uh, and seems to have some relevance to reality, although I'm not going to insist that that's what it's all about. And human interaction, which is the other big subject that economics is about. And both of these seem to require mathematical representation of their, to express them in a way that you can actually start thinking about and explore them. Now, mathematics requires precision, I think a tool for achieving clarity of statements. I know not everybody feels that expressing things in mathematics makes it easier to understand them, but uh, I realize that the main difficulty I have with papers in economics that don't use mathematics is that I find it very hard to uh, often to understand exactly what people think they're saying. I think the first and major point about mathematics is that it, it's a method of being clear. Uh, with an obvious difficulty, that not everyone may find it easy to understand. So it, for, it should force you to be very clear in what you're saying, but that doesn't, of course, make it easier for somebody to take it in. 
And mathematics is supposed to establish logically correct arguments. I think that's right too, that mathematics is a way of getting your arguments right. And that doesn't mean that people who use mathematics always get their arguments right or relevant. It aspires to establish true statements and having the right aspirations is a very important part of what we do in any subject or in any area. Uh, that, that's why I like to hear people say economics is a science because I think that suggests that aspirations. It doesn't mean that it's a successful science but uh, it's the right direction to be going. Similarly with mathematics. Mathematics expresses its assumptions with precision and that invites a disciplined assessment of the truth of the deductions that you make and of the relevance and the validity. The use of mathematics also encourages us to explore the implications of assumptions that are quite poor approximations to reality, perhaps are totally imaginary. People talk about toy models and they do because we have a lot of them in economics. Mathematical models are some of our most useful laboratory animals. Study of the prisoner's dilemma helps our understanding of actual situations that bore little resemblance to that simple model. Models of bargaining and negotiation show the role of mathematics in developing concepts. So it's not just a business of, of, of writing down assumptions and uh, calculating. It's a tool for conceptual developments. A Nash bargaining solution may be thought of as new words, but it's more than that. It's a major step in understanding how people can interact. Once we've learned a simple two-person version, we can get on to analyse bargaining possibilities in real settings. Once we've studied the Nash bargaining solution, we should be better placed to start discussing how countries could reach some kind of agreement on dealing with global warming. Many of the concepts that play a leading role in economics are provided by mathematics, you see. Indeed, interestingly enough, they were supplied quite often by mathematicians. So they may be part of economics, it doesn't mean economists did it. As a major example of that, I nominate probability, a tool that allows us to describe uncertainty. Humans, perhaps, especially those in the economic or financial professions, have a great deal of trouble dealing with uncertainty. The world is suffering some of the consequences. Having a language to describe uncertainty did not and cannot solve all these problems, but it is an essential start. Ignorance or incomprehension of what's already established economics, I think, made a large contribution to the severity of the recent recession. And I intend to illustrate that thesis with some examples. Mathematics can be quite hard to use, difficult to understand. The problems we have to deal with are actually sometimes quite difficult. What are the likely consequences of having competitive markets for collateralized debt obligations? That needs to be translated into a precise mathematical question which can then, to an extent, be answered. And the answer can be explained without mathematics, although most people seem to have some difficulty in understanding it when you put it into words. One could approach these issues by other means, of course. The alternative to mathematical formulation and reasoning would be analogical reasoning, I suppose. Looking for historical parallels or similar contracts you think are well understood. I actually haven't seen any success there. An example would be, uh, this is an unfair example actually, but there's a widespread claim that people should not take insurance, for example, buy certain kinds of swaps, unless they have an insurable interest. Taking insurance is entering a contract with uncertain consequences. So does that principle imply that people should not buy shares. Well, of course, it had better not, because uh, we can immediately see the disadvantages of that doctrine. There's an interesting set of issues here, all about incentives. 
Reasoning by analogy will not sort it out. You have to understand the logic of the situation, and that usually requires mathematics or something very like it. The first of the specific topics that I'll talk about, you will recognize, is rather general. Uh, I think, and uh, a number of people think, that the major achievement of economics is to show that under certain circumstances, quite limited circumstances, competitive markets are optimal. It seems that some people have thought that means it is a good thing to have as many competitive markets as possible including a great variety of financial assets, such as options, swaps, and other derivatives. And that idea also implies that short selling, for example, should be available. Perhaps even that insider trading should be legal, since restriction on an economist's and economic agent's rights to trade seems to be the antithesis of a free market. Perhaps there are many who even regret that markets for loans can't be perfect, Meaning that you, if it were a perfect market, you could borrow an arbitrary amount at the market interest rate. You wouldn't have to mention embarrassing things like collateral. The circumstances required for a free market economy to be optimal include a tax and transfer system that can be regarded as optimal. That involves what are traditionally called discretionary taxes, distortionary taxes. I don't at all mean that the taxes have to be lump sum. I do think that uh, you can extend the theory in just that way. It might be ridiculous if they were. But it can be disputed whether it's proper to assume that taxes are optimal, but it would not usually make sense to urge market regulation on the government on the grounds that its tax system is wrong, instead of putting arguments that the tax system itself ought to be put right. Our current disquiet with people's belief in free markets, actually, I think, has a quite different basis. Another assumption that's required if competitive markets are to be optimal is that there'll be no moral hazard. There is moral hazard if some person's actions have uncertain consequences which will be observable, although the actions themselves are not observable. A businessman presumably spends most of his time thinking and doing things that are not directly observable. When the project he has selected after unobservable thought operates, there will be observable consequences, profit and loss. We can invent assets such as shares in the businessman's profits, which seem to be just what the free market ideal requires. But such an asset provides the businessman with perfect insurance meaning that he has no financial incentive to think about projects to good purpose. That's a simple indication of the mathematical argument developed long ago that in this case, where there is moral hazard, it is not optimal to have a perfect market. The mathematical economics of general equilibrium says that there should not be competitive markets for assets subject to moral hazard. The textbooks should have emphasized the point much more than they do, but if you say what is standard and received and established economic doctrine, that is it. Evidently, this is an argument that applies widely. There are plenty of markets that presumably do not suffer from the moral hazard problem, but in finance, most markets probably do. It's a major issue. It's probably widely believed by people who know about moral hazard, even by economists, that the answer to the problem is insurance contracts. Well, it's fine to provide the businessman with some insurance against loss, but it should not be full insurance. The right amount, it is hoped, would be determined by a single lender, a single insurance company, for example, what AIG should have been doing, uh, imposing the condition that no other similar insurance contract on the same risk be set up. But the correct theory shows that may not be so. Purchase and sale of other commodities may influence the businessman's unobservable thought processes. Perhaps management education, 
though the disastrous innovations of the finance industry suggest the opposite. But all this suggests a further role for government taxation or regulation. It may even be possible to influence his efforts by direct regulation, and indeed there's a lot of that kind of regulation in the real world. I'm quite right, there should be. What I mean to suggest is that some of the economic world's recent problems arose from ignorance of or ignoring established, established economic theory. And that economic theory is generally expressed in mathematics. And the account I've been giving is, I think, a verbal version of something that would be better expressed in mathematics. The moral hazard issue, most important in the context of mortgage and other asset lending, is only one of the contributions to the recent and current crisis. I and mean, I'm not at all wanting to suggest that this is all that matters. And indeed, there have been a lot of interesting contributions at this conference, pointed out all of the other things. Uh, although, interestingly, some of the biggest issues don't seem to have come up. Next issue I want to, to talk about is swaps, gambles. Uh, actually, having uh, written this, I was delighted to read a piece in the Financial Times by John Kay just the other day when he was describing swaps as gambles, which is uh, what I want to do. A great deal of financial trading is trading between economic agents with different beliefs as to what's going to happen. Well, that's a, a presumably verifiable statement, but I will just suppose that it's true. The notional capital involved in swaps, which are of that nature, is enormous, apparently, as multiple of gross world product. We can call such transactions gambles on the grounds that much gambling is likewise based on differences of belief, although obviously not all gambling has that character. But uh, I, like uh, John, use the term gambling to suggest that they're probably rather a bad idea. In the Arrow de Bro model of general equilibrium, and this is in some ways the highest expression of, of mathematical economic doctrine, and is presented classical in the, classically in de Bro's theory of value, classical in the usual sense, that a lot of what we learn <coughs> is based on it, and uh, uh, very few of us read it. But in, in that, people's utility is a function of their consumption and labor in the various possible states of nature. That formulation, notably and brilliantly, allows for uncertainty. But it has not always been understood that utility, in the sense that it appears in this theory, depends both on people's tastes and on their beliefs. That dependence can be made explicit if uh, you reduce utility to expected utility and imagine that the people in this world of general equilibrium are expected utility maximizers. And we know a lot of that is typical of models. But then different people can have different subjective probability distributions describing their beliefs about the state of the world, as well as different utility functions, which is different tastes. Of course, we know that expected utility does not describe most people's preferences or behavior very well. Uh, perhaps it should. I, I'd certainly like to argue that proposition. But I, I'm not prepared to say that expected utility is a, is a good empirically established account of people's behavior. Uh, and that looks like one of the merits of the Arrow de Bro model, that it doesn't depend on that particular formulation. Now, in the Arrow de Bro model, there are markets for all state conditional goods and services. A number of important assumptions are made which lead to the result that competitive equilibrium exists, and under weaker assumptions, and when there are no externalities, 
any competitive equilibrium would be Pareto efficient. Meaning, uh, you remember, that sim simultaneous improvement of everyone's utility is not possible. Under distinctly stronger, but still useful assumptions, any Pareto efficient allocation, frequently called an optimum, although I don't like to, can be realized as an equilibrium. That sounds like a case for universal free markets. And here we have the leading case of how mathematics can seriously mislead us. Because it seems to me, at least, that it's not reasonable to want to make a person's utility, in the Ira de Brewer sense, as large as possible. If someone believes that smoking cannot hurt her, and is nevertheless hurt as a result of smoking, even killed, in many possible states of the world, then we should not measure her well-being by her own utility assessment. It seems to me ridiculous to do so. And that's exactly what you are doing if you take utility, say expected utility, using the probabilities that people believe in as, their, uh, as a description of their well-being. In the financial case, these are real issues. You see, it's not just a matter of uh, mathematical doctrine. Uh, in the financial case with swaps and other gambles based, for example, on insolvency risk, the effects of trade-based and divergent beliefs is, I should think, to increase risk in the economy. That's a bit vague, but uh, we are aware of large losses being sustained and large gains on the other side of the transaction which could not have happened if the parties had had the same beliefs, expressible by the same probability distribution. We should expect high leverage, where really there should have been none, creating increased default risk for other transactions. I take it that is what should be meant by systemic risk. Now, it's not at all clear what it would be best to do about the problem. Turning away from mathematics is not the answer. Where would that take us? It must be acknowledged that mathematics can mislead us in exactly the same way that ordinary language can mislead us. That's what's going on here. It's not properly understanding the, the, what's in the discourse. No, should, no one should think it is, can be, or ought to be easy to appreciate all mathematical propositions. It just has to be done right. I can understand that some will say that it's still right to leave people free to maximize their subjective utility, even if it does not measure their well-being. There may be some appeal in the idea that they then have an incentive to improve their beliefs. This is the doctrine that there ought to be competitive equilibrium, even if it, if it isn't optimal, which is what I think that really the, uh, the, 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 the standard conservative position is. But that clearly creates externalities, since honest people, intent on keeping their promises, but who act on the basis of false beliefs, may not be able to avoid default. And we know what trouble default and fear of default can lead to. This is not the place to start a serious analysis of optimality in the presence of divergent beliefs. It ought to have a high place on the economist's agenda. Now, I realize that, um, although I haven't reached my 20 minutes yet, that, uh, we, uh, you we are, of course, very really anxious about Well, to, I have two notes here that lunch. says we have to leave at 120, so... I see. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Well, I d uh, it, it, th th this is, in fact, a point at which I can stop. I was going to go on to much more concrete examples of where... Uh, I, of course, I'm going to say a little just to... Okay. very quickly summarize so that you know what you don't have to miss because you can go on the web and uh, read, the, read the paper. I wanted to take the example of value at risk VAR uh, say well he here's what goes wrong if people try to avoid mathematics and I think the same is true of uh, just dealing with means and standard deviations which is trying to keep to relatively simple mathematics. I think that you can really run into serious problems if you don't uh, try to get people right into mathematics, perhaps by educating them right at school. 
Uh, and uh, in the end, I wanted to say all this has to do with regulation. And if we're saying, what are we going to do next? <laughs> then I think we really have to apply our mathematical economics to thinking out what the regulation should be. But on the basis of what I've been talking about, my conjecture is that an awful lot of assets should be dis uh, eliminated.